So welcome back. At this time, we're going to talk about deep historical forces. And deep historical forces are actually pretty hard to categorically define. They are forces that have an unknown origin. They come, and once they do arrive, they generally change the course of human history in some sort of um, irreversible fashion. And of course, they also serve as a catalyst for events. Now, we will talk about nine different deep historical forces, but keep in mind, this division of nine forces into kind of distinct numbers or steps is only for the purpose of discussion. They all kind of blend and touch um, each other. It's just that's not a very useful way of explaining them uh, without giving them kind of discrete numbers. So the first one that we're going to talk about is the Industrial Revolution. And the Industrial Revolution basically turned agrarian economies, or turns agrarian economies, into industrialized economies. Typically, we think of the Industrial Revolution as something that started in England sometime around the 1600s to 1700s. It's not like there's an exact date. We can't say, you know what, on March 23rd, 1659, the Industrial Revolution started. No. It was a culmination of a variety of economic, social, and political changes that occurred. And, of course, as it was occurring in England, it slowly spread to Europe and then, of course, to the rest of the world as well. And so, historically in England, the kind of the seed of the Industrial Revolution occurred in agricultural communities during the winter. And what do you think farmers in England did during the winter, especially in the Middle Ages and the High Middle Ages and all the way through the Renaissance? Well, probably not much. I mean, of course, if they had animals, they still had to tend to them, but in terms of working with crops, there wasn't a lot to do. So merchants would take raw materials in their wagons and they would drop them off at farms and tell the farmers to perform some sort of a value-added task on these materials. So think of, for example, they would give them some iron and tell them to make pens or nails out of it. Or maybe they would give them heaps of wool and tell them to make yarn out of it. Different things like that. And at the end of the winter, the merchants would come, collect these materials, and then pay the farmers a premium for their goods or for the services that they had performed. So what you see is kind of an early division of labor. But there were some other things that were also going on. You start having an abundance of cheap labor, and this was caused by what they called then the fencing in of the commons movement that occurred in England. So in England, there used to be what they called the commons, and these were areas that belonged to nobles, sometimes uh, the, the king or queen, and whatever a peasant could find in the commons, the peasant could keep. So for example, if they picked some berries or mushrooms, those were things that they could eat and enjoy for themselves. And this was kind of a nice uh, way to supplement their income. And of course, peasants also farmed land that belonged to members of the nobility. As the Industrial Revolution starts, a lot of these farms are converted into other things like uh, kind of early factories, and then the commons are also fenced in, so peasants can't just go on there and pick mushrooms or berries or whatever they were doing before. So you have a lot of people in England, peasants, fleeing to the cities to look for work. So there's an abundance of cheap labor. Now, England also had an interesting institution that was developing called a corporation. We'll talk a little bit more about this in some later modules, but the corporation was basically a way for investors to pool resources to fund some sort of a common venture. This funding of corporations was one way that factories became built in England because it was a large pooling up of resources. So it was an abundance of capital, particularly funneled through the corporation, that facilitated the arrival of factories. And then finally, there was an abundance of natural resources in England, too. Of course, they found coal deposits and things like that, but they were also bringing in a lot of natural resources from their colonies. So this abundance of cheap labor, capital, and natural resources was the cause of the Industrial Revolution in England. Um, to supplement that, you also had the fact that England had a good system of uh, roads, which was accelerated by uh, railways a little bit later on. They had strong markets in existence, and of course, common law in England is a very unique idea and institution that prioritizes things like the ownership of 
private property, which was unique in Europe at that time. Um, the idea that members of the nobility uh, that were not the first son could also work. So there are a lot of ideas and institutions floating around England that facilitated the Industrial Revolution and served as a, a model for other European nations uh, to copy. Now, generally speaking, we are taught that the Industrial Revolution is something that's beneficial and, uh, and it helps people, but it does make things harder on people, which we'll talk about in just a second. On the good side of the Industrial Revolution is that the total number of goods and services produced in the 20th century has exceeded all that was produced in previous recorded human history. So there's a lot more goods to go around, and even though, generally speaking, there is a greater degree of inequality, which is our next historical force, So even though the Industrial Revolution has contributed to increasing inequality, nonetheless, the average safety net or the average quality of life of people across the world has risen. And if you're not sure about that, think about this for a second. You can look in some of the poorest areas of America, and chances are those poor people living in the United States still enjoy a greater quality of life than perhaps even a nobleman living in the Middle Ages of Europe. So yes, the inequality widens, but at least the bottom or the average goes up as well. So let's talk a little bit more about this inequality. Of course, inequality, as we'll talk about during our modules on Marxism, exists everywhere in every nation, and um, certainly causes a lot of conflict between social classes and between nations as well. Now, the main message that I want you to take away from Inequality, which I will repeat again, is that yes, it is true that there are the one percenters and the 99 percenters, and the disparity of wealth that has existed since the Industrial Revolution is greater than it has ever been. Nonetheless, our quality of life on average is higher. Population growth is another deep historical force. And generally speaking, population has grown throughout human history. But after 1825, we saw a huge spike in population. And think about why that might be. Well, first of all, water became cleaner, at least in uh, industrializing Europe. The fact that clean drinking water was widely available really kind of helped eliminate things like typhoid fever, cholera, things like that. Um, there are also advances in medicine. Think about the advent of antibiotics, all these kind of uh, vaccines, smallpox vaccines in particular, all these kinds of vaccines, all this kind of new sanitation winds up producing the deaths from uh, disease. Then of course, mechanized farming. It meant that people could count on more available and cheaper food. So there was a lot going on uh, starting around the 1820s that greatly accelerated population growth. Now, in industrialized countries today, there is a declining population growth due to infertility. But that's not always true in nations that are still undergoing their industrial uh, revolution. The current population trends are also aggravating the wealth gap between the highest earners and the lowest uh, earners within nations, but also in between nations. So what that means is the wealthiest countries are getting richer because of declining population growth, and the industrializing countries are actually getting poor because their population continues to increase. Generally speaking, one of the population trends that people project is that sometime between the year 2050 and 2075, the population will peak somewhere around 9 or 10 billion, and then it will start to kind of even out. However, I really would advise you to not take a lot of these projections on population growth too seriously. The reason being, every 50 years or so, some writer, whether it's Thomas Malthus or um, the Limits to Growth or whoever these writers are, come up with these grandiose ideas of what the population trends will be over the next 50 to 100 years, and almost universally they've been proven wrong. Whatever the population trends are, 
I think is anyone's best guess. The next one we're going to look at is technology. So throughout history, there have been all sorts of kind of different advice um, devices that have basically changed commerce and their activities. Let's think of what some of them might be. Of course, the easiest one that we think of is primitive man and fire, right? But let's take something maybe a little bit more recent. How about the printing press, Gutenberg's uh, printing press, or excuse me, the printing press, Gutenberg's printing press, which eventually wound up resulting in things like the Gutenberg Bible. Okay. When you look at medieval Europe, who do you think had books? Well, it was priests and extremely wealthy people. Some of you may know Geoffrey Chaucer, the middle-aging medieval English writer. Chaucer supposedly had one of the most extensive libraries in all of England. It had 50 books in it. 50 books. A book was the equivalent of a luxury car, and you think about why. It was only very, very educated and specialized people, usually monks, who hand copied manuscripts, word for word, and beautiful calligraphy. It made books really something rare and expensive. And because books were so rare and expensive, the transfer of ideas throughout Europe was very difficult. And furthermore, most people were illiterate. So what that meant is that the medieval church had a monopoly on knowledge, had a monopoly of information, essentially, because they were, generally speaking, the producers of books. Now, once the printing press came around, of course, that meant that the written word became accessible to lots of people. Think about the Gutenberg Bible. The Gutenberg Bible meant that anyone conceivably could have a Bible in their own homes and they could interpret the Bible for themselves without the need for a priest to tell them what the Bible said. Think of the fact that Martin Luther translated the Bible, that same Bible in from Latin, or excuse me, he translated from the ancient Greek directly to Saxish, which was a German dialect. So he basically skipped the Vatican's translation of the Bible and put the original Greek translation of the Bible into a vernacular that common Germans could understand. This really undermines the intellectual and moral authority of the medieval church. Furthermore, the printing press enabled all sorts of dissonance to spread inflammatory material about their monarchs, their princes. Anything that they wanted to say could be printed and distributed easily and cheaply. So this really took away the monarchy, or excuse me, the monopoly of information that was held by nobility and of course the church. Of course we can think of some other examples of deep historical forces. Think of the steam engine, right? I mean the steam engine basically revolutionized America. It meant that, and of course Europe as well, but I'm speaking maybe from an American context, it meant that people, ideas, and products could go from one end of the country to another easily. You know, one book that I, uh, I really enjoy is called By Ox Train to California. And in that book it describes how a family got into an ox cart and went across America. They had to fight uh, restless natives, disease, starvation, bad weather, and then, you know, at the end of the book, as an old woman, she reflects on the fact that now she could go across the state in a week and it was safe. So the steam engine, of course, really revolutionized, uh, at least in the U.S. especially, but then also Europe, okay, facilitating commerce. So new technologies, of course, are generally seen to foster some sort of productivity gain, like the printing press, okay, enabling books to be produced cheaply, or the steam engine, allowing commerce and ideas to travel from one point to another cheaply and safely. So again, because of that productivity gain, it can promote human welfare, but it can also make people agitated. Think about, for example, the internet and how that has spread ideas dramatically. But of course, when there is un unrule or unrest, those ideas can quickly transfer uh, from one corner of the globe to the other through the use of the internet. So it can make people a little bit agitated. Furthermore, technology can change the number and types of jobs that are available. Uh, one of my neighbors, I think, is a good example of this. His first job was a typist. You know, he was one of the few people that knew how to operate a typewriter. 
Of course, when modern word processing software came about, he was out of a job. Of course, he managed to trans uh, get some new skills and he uh, wound up working as a real estate agent. But the point is, life was made difficult on him for a while because he had to learn a new skill set. And that's what technology does. Of course, there are different kinds of technology, kind of we call them waves of technology. So starting again around the 1780s, this is when you had water power in the early Industrial Revolution. So, you know, they had a wheel next to a river and that powered factories. Uh, textiles and iron became kind of the main products at that time. Then, of course, you had the second wave of, indu of the Industrial Revolution starting around the 1840s or so. And that's when you start having uh, the railways and their boom. And that lasted a little, uh, a little less uh, long. Around the 1900s, that, 1900s, that's when you kind of start having electricity popping up. That's when you start having the chemical revolution. Um, the internal combustion engine, which we use in cars today, is also sprang up. Then starting around the 1950s, again, the periods are getting a little bit shorter. Then you start having petrochemicals, more electronics, aviation. And then about 40 years later, 1990, that's kind of when you start having the internet age that begins. You have software, new media, biotech. And I've always thought that now, starting over the past few years, this is when you start having the sharing age, where companies like Uber, Airbnb, you know, not even um, 15 years later, this kind of sharing age has also started up. And who knows what the next industrial, uh, excuse me, the, new, the next technological revolution will be. If I knew, I'd probably invest in it and be a millionaire by now. So, there's different waves of technological revolutions. Then we also have globalization. We have a couple modules on this theme, so don't worry, we'll get, have plenty of opportunity to talk about that. And Globalization basically means that there are these networks of human interaction that start to span worldwide distances, and that has some interesting consequences. Of course, first of all, there's a lot more economic activity, there's a lot more trade. Okay? But then it also looks at cultures that are changing, and I would argue in some ways globalization makes cultures more uniform. I've uh, traveled quite a bit uh, throughout my life and you know I haven't been to a country where I have not seen a McDonald's for example um, other than being in Iraq I don't think I've ever been to a country where I didn't see a Starbucks so in some ways there's kind of this uniform global culture uh, that is arising and of course that can one facilitate trade and communication but two, it can also lead to a degree of social unrest as people kind of start to fear losing their identity. We'll talk a lot, about more, a lot more about this in some future modules. So again, globalization is fostered by all sorts of new technologies. It wasn't just the steam engine and you know, aviation that uh, stimulate globalization, but in particular, the rise of the internet and social media platforms. Um, sometimes globalization has been slowed by wars. Of course, after World War I, the U.S. went into kind of an isolationist mode. That's kind of a common theme that occurs uh, throughout history. You know, wars can um, cause people to look maybe more inward, although World War II had the opposite effect. But don't worry, we'll talk about that in a couple modules. And of course, corporations in particular have been kind of the engines, another engine of globalization, where they take not just products and send them from country A to country B, but also managerial cultures, ideas, and techniques. We'll talk an awful lot about that. Then we have nation states, or the lack of. So a nation state, according to the definition of Max Weber, um, Max Weber was one of these Prussians that he lived in a time where he could pretty much be the best in multiple fields. He's a sociologist, an international relations theorist, a political scientist, orb theorist. I mean, he, he was a master of many, many domains. And he defined a nation state as any sort of a country that had a land, like I said, so a geography, um, or territory, you could say it, um, a border, and then what he called a folk, so some sort of a people or uh, maybe a nationality or an ethnicity, you could say, right? And nation states are generally seen as some sort of a product that arose after the fall of the Roman Empire. And typically, nation states see that the best way to increase their power is by taking the land of and resources of other countries. 
Now, you can argue that many nations today try to use trade to increase their power. However, of course, as we know, sometimes there are still unfortunate wars. Um, but that's a discussion for our business history module. So trade can also be seen to increase power, um, but it also means that corporations gain power at the expense of governments having power. So there becomes a tension uh, that is arising between governments and corporations through the rise of the nation state. And of course, a nation state can also be challenged by some of the other deep historical forces, um, such as epidemics, climate change, uh, terrorism, and of course, new international norms. Now, we typically think of a nation state as kind of normal, that's, that's what we're always taught, but I just want you to think for a, a second. There are movements that are quite frankly in contrast to the nation state. So I always say nation states or a lack of. Think of communism, for example. Communism encouraged uh, abandonment of national identity and an abandonment of national borders. So it was a direct challenge to the nation state. It wasn't just about everyone having the same, it was about an abolition of all the things that make nation states nation states. It was an international movement. Another movement that uh, I think is interesting is some of these groups like the European Union. European Union, in many ways, through socialization mechanisms, which we'll talk a little bit later, in some ways encourages Europeans to have dual identities, their national identity and then a European Union identity. Furthermore, with the abolition excuse me, abolition of borders means that people can go from one uh, territory to the next. So those things, you wind up having not a, a group of states in the European Union, but the European Union as almost a country. And in many ways, this is a, an affront to the concept of the nation state. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we get into our globalization. Then we have what we call dominant ideologies. And an ideology, as I mentioned, it's kind of this network of reinforcing beliefs and values that make some sort of a worldview. And the Industrial Revolution, of course, was facilitated by a variety of different ideologies. Remember, as I'm talking about these all kind of, uh, oh, I didn't write ideology down, did I? Or, excuse me. So there's a variety of ideologies that kind of have gone hand in hand with the Industrial Revolution, which has kind of led to some of these others. And of course, part of that's capitalism. Okay, the idea that the government should not be interfering in economic affairs. And we talked about that during our module on the market capitalism. Now, we also talk about things like common law and constitutional democracy. The idea that individuals have a right to private property, and that's something that the government cannot take away, take away from them. Compare that to other countries that have totalitarian regimes where people don't actually own their own property. Of course, I'm also thinking of monarchies during the Middle Ages. In those countries, people are less likely to work hard and take care of their property because it's not really their property. It can be taken away from them at any instant. It's a very different thing than an individual saying, this is my house, this is my home, I work hard to support my house. Some other dominant ideologies that are kind of separate from the Industrial Revolution, of course, there's one that you, know, you can argue for or against, that's progress. And that's the idea that humanity is kind of in this continuous um, upward motion towards kind of a social and material betterment. We'll talk more about that a little bit later in this uh, course. Of course, we have Darwinism and social Darwinism. And that's the idea that, um, well, Darwinism is there's this kind of constant improvement in the biological world, and then social Darwinism is basically that certain kinds of countries and sub-elements of society are rewarded or weeded out uh, based on the advances of humanity. Another ideology, and one that's, I think, unfortunately a little bit incorrect, which comes from Max Weber, which was the Protestant work ethic, and that was the idea that um, Hard work, savings, and thrift would lead to salvation to some extent. And this was Max Weber's way of kind of explaining why countries in Northern Europe like Prussia were, and Sweden were so much better than all the countries in Southern Europe. And he in large part attributed that to the Protestant religion. Well, I mean, there were other countries in, in Europe that were not Protestant were still relatively prosperous. Bavaria, for example, was predominantly Catholic and was very successful. 
Um, other countries like France was still a very prosperous country even during Max Weber's time, which again is some sort of a divide between Catholicism and atheism. So I really disagree with um, Max Weber's Protestant work ethic. I think the things that he, were talking, that he was talking about, the hard work, savings, thrift, and honesty, probably stem more from a tradition in northern European countries of common law, which tended historically to favor the right of private property. I think it's more of a, a, a holding of private property than it is perhaps anything pertaining to religion. And of course, the 20th century, uh, because of the internet, increased literacy, all sorts of information innovations have spread a variety of ideologies uh, throughout the world. Now, the next one is leadership. You know what, I'm gonna put this right up here. And leaders, of course, have been beneficial and detrimental to societies and business. And there's a couple ideas with leaders. Some people say that you know, a leader is just the right person at the right moment, and they are kind of riding the wave of history. You know, it's just the right place, right time. And then, of course, some also think that leaders themselves are the driving forces of history. I'll let you be the judge of that. And then, of course, we have chance. And some things in human course, of course, may be related to just luck. Um, Machiavelli, of course, said that luck favors the prepared individual, but, I mean, that's kind of hard to say. There are some things that may be beyond any sort of preparation. My favorite example is the, bu the bubonic plague. Who would have ever thought that there were tribes coming from Mongolia launching the cadavers of plague victims, you know, during sieges, and that would spread a, a terrible disease throughout Europe. Um, these are great examples of kind of chance. So what we've done is we've talked about these nine different deep historical forces. Now our next two videos, we're going to talk about things that impact the external environment, aka the market environment, and then we'll switch gears and talk about things on the internal environment. That's usually kind of internal corporate culture sort of thing. So I'm looking forward to seeing you then.